Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and Complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and Complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Perlakis, and I'm delighted to have with us this morning Dr. Jared Frizzell from the Christ Hospital in uh, Cincinnati. Um, Dr. Frizzell has uh, uh, been one of the up-and-coming expert operators in the field. He's done tremendous work uh, building the program at Christ and the previous hospital, and uh, he's also the director of the CHIP and Complex Interventions on the program, but also a lot of fun to work with and uh, a lot of good insights about how to learn and how to get this done. So, Jared, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's really an honor. And I always ask people to give us a little uh, overview. How did you end up doing complex cases in Cincinnati in 2023? Sure. Um, So it was a little bit of a winding road to get here. Um, I am from Kentucky, you know, born and raised, so just across the Ohio River, and uh, went to med school there, met my wife, and she wanted to go out west for training. And so we spent seven years out in Albuquerque, New Mexico, at the University of New Mexico. I did my internship year at the University of Kentucky, then transferred out there, did my last two years of internal medicine. I did a two-year critical care fellowship, and then I did my uh, general cardiology out there. Uh, before heading to Indianapolis to do my interventional uh, year at St. Vincent uh, with Jim Hermiller. And uh, one of the things that I remember, like looking back, was encountering some CTOs during my general year. Um, There was one patient I had in particular, and he had recently moved to Albuquerque. Um, Actually, I think he was planning on moving to California, but his car broke down outside of Albuquerque. And he ended up just sticking around. <laughs> and he had a Lima to LED, and that was it. The entirety of the rest of his vessels were all collaterals off of the LED. And he had such severe angina. And, um, you know, we, we basically were telling him that there's nothing really that we can do, that we can offer him. Um, I don't know, like in hindsight, um, I know that Rob Federici's in New Mexico in Albuquerque, and I knew the name, but I didn't even, you know, none of us at the VA, you know, thought to refer him to see if there's any other options. And so we just tried our best to manage him medically. And uh, around that same time, I remember doing a case at the university um, with one of my mentors there, uh, Mark Sheldon, who is the program director. And um, this patient had a CTO and he just turned to me and said, you know, there's some people that not only would open that up, but they would dissect on purpose to do it. Um, like it was it, like it was, and it still is in a way like some crazy idea. And that really kind of got the wheels turning. And then, um, because I already, I, you know, I knew my personality and I like doing stuff. I like, you know, problem solving and, you know, figuring things out and being able to help people. And I think that's something that's in common with a lot of CTO operators. And then I went to St. Vincent, and um, they were doing a fair amount of CTOs there. Um, the guy there that was doing them was, was Chuck Orr. And he had been, uh, Chuck graduated fellowship in 1981. And so he was there at the birthplace of angioplasty, essentially uh, modern angioplasty. And he moved from Kentucky to Indianapolis because some guy in Indy had done an ungodly number of angioplasties. And that number was 100. Um <laughs> And uh, so he kind of grew up with the entire field of PCI, and he started doing them years ago. He, um, like, went out to Bellingham, I think, in 2008, 2009, at Lombardi, and started doing them. And and that was really a treat to work with Chuck, um, because what he thought of as high risk was not the same as, uh, like, we think of high risk, you know, because when he started, 25% of people went emergently to cabbage, and, you know, 10% of people went into V-fib with injections. And so it was a much different mindset. Um, I should, I'll also say that Chuck happens to be my father-in-law. Um, I won't get into a lot of the psychology of my wife, like marrying someone that went into the same field as her dad. Um, we are, we are alike in a lot of ways. We're also very different in key ways. 
Um, but in the lab, at least, he and I uh, thought very much alike. And that really working with him and being able to do these and being able to offer these really, you know, something just kind of clicked. Um, I realized pretty early on that, you know, my personality in general, I could either be, you know, mediocre at a lot of things, you know, do a little bit of complex coronary, a little bit of structural, you know, St. Vincent is really big and structural, um, or, you know, do some peripheral work, but I would much rather be really, really good at one thing like that. That's kind of my, my progression. And for me, um, you know, it didn't take long for me to figure out that structural didn't really excite me as much as complex coronary. Um, I mean, I don't want to, you know, talk bad about structural by any respect, but I, I feel like, you know, the problem solving aspect of complex coronary work was much more than structural for me. It just resonated with me more. I know there are really hard structural cases. Um, and there are a lot of tavers that are straightforward and there are even some CTOs that are straightforward, but it's just kind of a different beast. Um, maybe it was that eight hour uh, transcatheter mitral valve replacement that put the nail in the coffin for me not wanting to do structural. Um, but I find it ironic in a lot of respects that, you know, CTOs get a knack for being kind of long procedures and stuff. And that was one reason why I didn't really want to do those structurals. And that was certainly a reason why I didn't want to do EP. I mean, staring at dots on a screen being placed for hours at a time isn't, you know, my idea of a thrilling time, but something about doing them and, you know, being active in it and within CTOs really just got me going and being able to help people that didn't really have options. Um, like, you know, if I had a time machine, it can go back to that patient in Albuquerque and being able to say, Hey, maybe there's something that I can do. And instead of just kind of treating your angina until, you know, hopefully part infarcts enough so that you don't feel it anymore, uh, which is eventually probably what happened. Wow. So that was a, uh quite a long trip and I guess that must be pretty nice to have your father-in-law teach you the basics of uh, complex PCI. This is awesome. Yeah, but then, it, was, it was an interesting <laughs> experience, I'll say that. <laughs> and then how did you, so you, you got into the area, you got your interventional training, you got interested in doing the complex coronary, uh, you got the training obviously uh, to some extent and you're doing your general fellowship, but then did you do some proctoring? How did you get your uh, you know, hands and uh, feet wet, so to speak, and being able to do more and more of these cases. Yeah. Um, so basically, how did I develop my chops? Um, and ah. the the answer is, um, uh, it's also kind of a, a winding road, I guess. So after that, so my wife, um, Charlotte, is an orthopedic trauma surgeon. And so she, uh, I mean, she's, she's a badass, obviously. And um, we were trying to find a place for us to land, you know, interventional cardiology, orthopedic trauma surgery, you know, for a, a two physician thing, it's often hard enough to match together, but to have really specialized, especially with me having an interest in, you know, complex higher risk stuff. Um, and the place that we ended up um, out of training was in Evansville, Indiana. And I was still with the St. Vincent system. And Evansville, um, it's about uh, 300,000 people uh, is the metro area. And it's actually pretty close to my hometown in Western Kentucky. That was like the biggest city around. And um, I started doing cases down there. And I remember when I moved there, I told them, hey, I, you know, I want to do CTOs. I want to do this other stuff. And they're like, oh, yeah, sure, that's fine. You know, um, you won't have many, but it's nice that you want to do that. And I was like, well, you know, okay, I'm serious. We'll see how it goes. And I was also able to keep my foot in the door in a way in Indianapolis. So I would spend three days a month driving from Evansville to Indy, which is about a three and a half hour drive. Um, and I would drive up there and I'd do cases um, and be able to work with fellows because, you know, growing up, I always thought I would be, you know, in a teaching environment. I was always planning on being a college professor. I didn't, you know, think of medicine until college. My family is chock full of teachers. There's not any, you know, no way in medicine, really. That's just what we do. And so um, I started doing CTOs in Evansville, but still having that connection to Indianapolis. And it was really a great learning curve um, for me to be able to do these on my own. And, you know, in southwestern Indiana and western Kentucky and southern Illinois, it's a very, you know, there's a lot of, frankly, you know, familial hyperlipidemia heterozygotes down there plus smoking, um, you know, plus diabetes and, and everything else. And so there's a ton of coronary disease. And when I arrived down there, um, you know, I, or within my first few months, I saw people being referred to hospice for, you know, refractory angina. Like, that's how bad it was. And um, one of my early partners down there, one of the older people, 
you know, I mentioned, you know, well, surgeons turn them down, then, you know, what's the point? You know, what can we do? And me then starting to go, oh, there are these things, there are these techniques, there are, you know, these options available. And being able to do more and more on my own, and then if it's really complicated, being able to take those with me when I traveled back to Indianapolis and kind of having both those experience, I got a lot of procedures really, really fast. And um, so even though when I went down there, and this is kind of opposite of the advice I think a lot of young trainees got, including the advice that I got from some people, is to when you first get out, you know, make sure to build your in, you know, to don't tackle super complex cases, you know, or work with an older partner or something like that. But if you're in an environment where nobody else is really doing it, um, my kind of view was, you know, I know that I've developed these skills. And before I graduated fellowship, uh, you know, my mentors in Indy kind of set me down and said, hey, listen, you've got the knack. Like, that's what they said. You, you know, you just happen to be somebody that, you know, we were really proud of the, the way that you've learned and stuff like that. And that was really flattering. And it gave me some confidence that I didn't otherwise have, frankly. Um, and so I felt comfortable tackling these cases um, because, you know, it was sort of a use it or lose it. Like I have, you know, this training, you know, and I've had, I've did all these cases and stuff like that. And I felt like if I'm able to do it in a smart way and be methodical about it, and then also have the opportunity to take cases with me to Indianapolis. And, you know, even though it was a long drive for patients, you know, because I was their doctor, I was there with them, you know, they were more likely to make it. That was kind of an ideal scenario for me starting out. And I was able to rapidly accumulate, you know, a lot of cases. Um, and I was there in Evansville for three years, and then we made the jump back to Indianapolis, which is kind of another story um, in and of itself. But uh, long story short, we decided to move to Indianapolis. Um, it was in the early 2020. And then, you know, this, some, this strange new virus happened, uh, which totally <laughs> screwed everything up. And um, Charlotte ended up doing some you know, she was having to do part-time locums work um, because if you shut down all elective joints, um, you know, every, every orthopedic surgeon thinks they're a trauma surgeon. Um, and so I was in Indianapolis then, and then I was traveling back to Evansville to still do cases down there because they got used to having, you know, this sort of option. Um, so still doing a ton of cases in Indy, driving to Evansville, which is a seven-hour round trip. I would give up at 5.30 a.m. Uh, or I mean, I would leave the house by 5.30 a.m., get to Evansville on Central Time just before 8, do three to five cases, then turn around and drive back. And so I did that for a year and a half. And then uh, this opportunity opened up in Cincinnati. Robert Riley was here. He kind of really built the program. And um, he was heading out for, for a variety of reasons and asked if I'd be interested. And it was kind of the perfect timing between, you know, me and what I was doing and then Charlotte, actually, there was a great job opportunity in Dayton, which is just a little north of Cincinnati. And so we both made the leap. Uh, we've been here now for about a year and a half, and it's been really, really rewarding. Um, when I was with St. Vincent, I was, you know, because of those trips to Evansville and also doing outreach clinic that everyone has to do, I was driving over a thousand miles a month, um, which wow. is it's really great um, for podcasts, um, especially <laughs> especially if you listen to it on 2X, which is, you know, what I think is the, you know, the only way to do it. Um, and uh, so I learned a lot. And I also took those time, that time, that driving time to um, think about cases. And this is one of the things that I did a lot of is I would just turn over angiograms in my head and think about techniques and what I can do and, you know, uh, both cases that are upcoming as far as planning goes, as well as cases that I had just done that day. So, you know, if you do, several, you know, do a few cases in a day and I've got a three and a half hour car drive ahead of me where it's just me that um, I'm able to, you know, turn over, okay, you know, what took so long? You know, by definition, the last thing I did worked, um, but why did it take so long to get there? Was it because these other things were safer and I tried that first? Um, or was it because I just didn't think of it in time? And in doing that, I also not only became much better as an operator, but I also became a lot more efficient where I was able to go, okay, well, next time I come across this, I'm just going to, instead of doing A, B, C, D, and E, I'm just going to skip straight to D because I didn't get a lot out of A, B, and C. Um, and as your skills grow and, you know, as you're able to just rapidly move through that, um, you know, you just become better. And especially if I'm looking at a three and a half hour drive ahead of me to get home, 
then it also pays to be more efficient, you know, because if I get through these cases, if I do a good job and I'm efficient, then there's a chance I might be able to see my girls before they go to bed that night. And that, that was kind of how I became a lot better at this. Um, it's not necessarily the best way that I would recommend because there's a lot of, a lot of time on the road, um, but it really helped in the end. Well, I mean, the, as you say, it was obviously a lot of work and a lot of back and forth at the same time. I mean, the key components, right? I mean, you were there. Um, I mean, you, you had the, key, the volume early on. Uh, you worked hard for it. I mean, doing all this driving, I mean, most people would not even consider, but you worked hard for it. And what I'm impressed for is that you're able to process, I guess, drive and process what has happened before. How do you do that? Was that something you always were doing or something that came naturally speaking when you were doing that? How did this evolve? Well, um, I always, um, you know, I always have a tendency to analyze and to think through stuff. Um, actually, if I didn't go into medicine, I was going to go into philosophy. That was kind of, uh, that's what I got into in college. And actually, I kind of stumbled my way into that. And if I'd got into it earlier, you know, we probably wouldn't be talking about this. Um, um, uh, I would be on a different path. But I was always kind of that kind of person uh, to think in and analyze in, you know, sort of academic or way, um, but also very pragmatic. Um, so it was really easy for me to think about that. I always was that kind of person. I also keep a lot of data. Um, you know, I know that you're someone that's notorious for keeping a lot of data. Um, so and keeping track of my own cases um, and figuring out patterns and stuff like that, you know, sometimes I just need some time alone with a spreadsheet to figure stuff out. So I always kind of had that mindset. And what I did at the end of the day is... Um, I would always stop by, there's this place in Evansville called Licks, L-I-C apostrophe S. And it's sort of like a, a Dairy Queen steak and shake kind of thing, but it's local. And I would always get a milkshake at the end of the day. If it was a good day, it was celebratory. If it was a bad day, it was a consolatory. But every day I picked up a milkshake and I just had that time to just think to myself and turn things over. And that was kind of a natural thing for me to do. Um, I was always a person that, you know, as a trainee and stuff, wanted to talk about cases almost as soon as they were over to troubleshoot and, the, you know, why did you do this? Why did you do that? And I would consistently ask questions um, and try to, to figure stuff out. Um, so I guess that's my kind of personality. I think it comes easier to some people. Some people are naturally like that, like have that natural curiosity. I think a lot of doctors are like that, and that's maybe part of why they went into medicine to begin with. But I've just never lost that as I got older, you know, that childlike sense of wonder and amazement at the world around us and what we're able to do. It's just, it's just really cool. And do you write it down at all or is it only your head? I don't always write it down. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll take um, notes um, on like the notes app on my phone or something like that when I'm trying to think of something, especially if it's on the way to bed, I'll think of that. Um, I'll also dream about angiograms. I don't know if I should confess that out loud, but, uh, <laughs> but I often will do. I'll dream of angiograms and, uh, you know, turning things over. And, um, you know, I've had, you know, everyone has bad case and stuff. And I'll say that I've never actually had a nightmare about a case. Um, but it's more of like a, you know, a, a cerebral sort of thing, I guess, turning it over. Um, I don't, I, I'm tired enough all the time now that I don't really talk in my sleep as much as I used to, but Charlotte knew I was going into cardiology when I was rotating in cardiology as a resident. And apparently I was loud enough that I woke her uh, up from sleep because while I was sleep talking, I said, well, I put him on a low salt diet and it was like a revelation. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't know that anybody else dreams about giving advice to heart patients um, other than me when I was a resident. Well, it's a good thing you didn't go into heart failure. So that worked yeah. out well. <laughs> and then when you, um, when you do that, like, do you ever find that you sleep, as you say, on a case, you think of something that's challenging, and the, the, when you get up in the morning, you have the problem solved or you have some good insights into it? How, how does that pan out? Yeah, so um, it works okay. You know, some things work better in dreams than in real life. Um, but you know, like recently, one thing that I tried that, um, kind of came in one of those sessions, I don't know, I don't remember if it was honestly in a formal dream, but by thinking and turning things over was, um, you know, like, so wire across gear won't go, right. That's probably, um, for me, if not the number one, at least in the top two, most annoying things about all of CTOs, uh, maybe number one is being able to get retrograde, but somehow, not delivering equipment or not making connection. That might be the, the single most, but number two is wire cross gear won't go. Cause you're like, it's right there. 
And there's only, you know, so many things you can do. You know, there's published algorithms uh, you're very well aware of and have published that. And one of the things that I tried um, that worked out a couple um, few months ago, uh, actually public, I'm publishing this, um, is to use a laser in the subinthymal space to modify the plaque around it. Um, that was one of the things that I kind of thought of that I've never seen anybody do. Uh, it made a lot of sense to me, especially uh, because of the way laser works. And, you know, if it's tight enough um, in there that you can't deliver anything, then my thought was you get more of the photo ablation effect instead of the, the mechanical effect. And so maybe less likely to perforate and that sort of thing. And so um, I tried that and it actually worked really well. Um, the technique, um, because, you know, you got to have some kind of catchy title. Um, we're calling it the El Taco technique um, for extra plaque laser to assist in crossing occlusion. I think I said El Taco. Um, so that's one <laughs> that's one of the things that, um, you know, that came out of these sessions that was, was really practical and really useful. And then when you plan for the cases, apart from this planning that you do informally as you drive or as you prepare them, do you actually, how long do you sit down with the angiogram and the team that you have and go over the films for every case? So I spend an inordinate amount of time with the angiogram. Um, most of that is by myself, and then we kind of review a little bit before the case. Um, one of the things that's really helpful, you know, regardless of where I've been, you know, Evansville, Indianapolis here in Cincinnati, is um, getting a whole team around you. And I find that a lot of staff lab, you know, a lot of the lab in the, the lab staff um, will self-select as to who wants to do CTOs and who, who doesn't. And I feel like setting the tone is really important for that and having a very open and collaborative environment because, you know, some of the best ideas that I've ever encountered have come from the staff um, and being able to walk through, you know, the angiogram and say, okay, these are the plans, you know, A, B, C, and D. I always go in with, you know, as many ideas as I can possibly think of. And, you know, that, that's something that really helps. So I spend a whole lot of time. I don't clock it uh, as far as how much time. And even then, you know, even on game day, so to speak, you know, going into the procedure, sometimes I'm looking at these angiograms and being like, oh, man, what the hell am I thinking? Like, how am I going to recreate an argument from scratch? And then somehow, you know, because you plan for it in advance, you thought through all of these things, um, you know, that the vast majority of time that it tends to work out okay. Uh, the way that I sort of picture it in my head is, you know, there's the algorithm, like the hybrid algorithm, for instance, and there's, you know, all sorts of algorithms within the algorithm. But, you know, a true algorithm is sort of like a series of if-then statements. Um, and I found that it was much more useful. And this is one of those, like, epiphanies that I had on the road, that it was much more useful to think about it instead of a strict, you know, algorithm, like step A, then step B, then step C all the time, to think about it more as like a, a web and so the picture I have in my head, I don't know if I'm going to describe this very well, is, you know, kind of like a sprawling interconnected spider web with multiple layers. And the more you start to go on one path, the more these other strands start to fade away because it closes off other opportunities. And what I found was, and this is part of my efficiency, is that if I move fast enough and I fail fast enough at this one aspect that I could catch this other strand before it falls and still be able to use that. Um, you know, an easy example of that is the more time you spend integrating the subintimal space, the longer the hematoma grows. And so, you know, that closes off a lot of options. But if you cycle through things really fast, not only does the case go faster, and frankly, it's less boring for me and everybody else that's just standing there, um, but you're actually able to have more opportunities to treat that patient, get the job done, and get them to feel better in a much safer way. Perfect. And then when you do that, do you have a, how do you balance the time? Is it just a fast pace trying to get through that? Or do you actually say time limits? Let's say I'm going to work for five minutes on undergrade and then go retro or ADR. How, how do you manage that? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. And I will echo, you know, so earlier this morning, I actually listened to your episode with Kate, and uh, which was phenomenal. Uh, you know, I love Kate. She's so awesome. Um, but you know, her like explicit time limits and setting a timer and having, having them do that and putting it up. I started doing that, um, you know, a few years ago, putting timers and stuff like that, being explicit, like, okay, I'm only going to spend, you know, X amount of time surfing these septals or whatever, or trying to get this epicardial over time. 
um, I've gotten away from explicit time limits because what I found is that um, <laughs> basically as I've gotten more efficient, my own patience for doing X, Y, and Z has shrank quite a bit. And so I kind of have my own internal timer that now is it's much shorter, I think, than a lot of what I used to set up as my timer. Um, and so I kind of have more of a feel, but that was very much a, a learned thing, you know, just practicing over and over with the timer. And now that I know like, oh, you know, X amount of time has passed or, you know, I, this isn't going to work. You know, I've tried and tried and tried. It's just not going to work. Give up, move on. Because I think one of the one of the big traps to fall into that a lot of uh, especially younger operators fall into or early learning is the trap of almost, you know, I've almost got it. I'm almost there. Um, you know, I've almost got this wired. And, but if you're still doing the same thing, almost isn't it, right? It's not horseshoes. It's not hand grenades. It's not nuclear weapons. You know, almost doesn't count. You have to get it. And being able to put that break on yourself is, you know, it can be very challenging. And then in terms of uh, anxiety, stress, how, how do you handle it? Do you have any stress before the cases? Are you pretty relaxed? How do you handle that part? Um, so I... I am kind of, I am relaxed. I'm just kind of, I try to be relaxed in general. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I'm trying to better myself on is kind of learn what you can control, learn what you can't. Um, what I think of a lot of times, and, you know, back when we had interventional fellows, like with St. V, I would do the, the talk on high risk, which is basically about how to think about this sort of thing. And one scene that, you know, I played in there was a snippet from Pixar is a good dinosaur film. And uh, there's this one scene where they're sitting around the campfire. And, you know, in that movie, there are some T-Rexes, but they're cowboys. Um, and like, so it's this classic Western, you know, campfire scene. And the, the little dinosaur, Arlo, asked the big one, the big, you know, dad T-Rex, you know, Butch, how'd you get your scar? And he goes into like how he was going to this watering hole and taking a drink. And then three big crocodiles like came and like bit his face and, and he says, but I wasn't ready to die that day. And so, you know, he like, he ends up fighting him off. And Arlo was like, but weren't you scared? And he was like, you know, yeah, of course I was scared. You know, if you're, if you're not scared getting your face bit off by a croc, then you're just not alive. And I think about that in dealing with these higher risk cases, because, you know, there's some component of, you know, I think it is kind of a fear or, you know, stress or anxiety or being able to work through it because, you know, these are pretty challenging cases it's really hard to work on somebody's heart while it's actually beating. It's considered somewhat of a faux pas if it stops during the procedure. So you don't even have that going for you. Um, and so there is that certain amount of anxiety. And then you just have to kind of, you know, over time, you build your confidence as you do a lot of these cases. And, you know, you take, you know, sometimes, you know, you do things. I think for me, at least doing, say, star and using that as a bailout and saying, you know what? I don't need to take an Estado down there. I'm just going to start out, I'll balloon it, and it'll be okay. And being able to have safe off-ramps and develop that has really helped going into the procedure knowing, okay, there are safe ways that I can deal with this. Um, and that, that comes, I think, with time and doing these cases and, you know, practicing being okay. And when it comes to complications, which, you know, no matter what you do, at the end of the day, if you do these cases, you won't really come with complications. How do, how do they affect you? Do you get depressed? Do you get upset? Uh, how, how do those complications uh, uh, affect you and, and what do you do about it? Um, I think everybody deals with complications a little bit differently. Um, and, you know, obviously not all complications are the same. Uh, and I think a lot of this, and maybe, it, maybe it, you know, I hope it's not just me, but part of the reasons that we go into this field is that we care about people and we really want to help people. And, you know, it's may not be, you know, like CTOs, you know, it may not be saving their life, but trying to help them live their life better. And you're doing that out of a sense of concern for people and care. And so when something bad happens, then that's, it's really hard. I mean, it's hard on me. Um, and um, what I do is I seek, you know, refuge in a, a few places. Um, I seek refuge in friends. Um, and I would encourage everyone, you know, if you don't already have a good support network, especially... Um, I would say other interventionalists or other people that, that do these sort of higher risk procedures that, you know, you can troubleshoot with, but also sometimes you just need a place to vent when things go south. And, you know, being able to express that and not bottle it up has been really helpful. Um, I spend a lot of time with my family. Uh, I've got, you know, my wife um, who has her own busy, you know, practice, but we also have, you know, three girls 
Uh, their ages are 10, 8, and almost 4. And so spending time with them, uh, one of the things that I say, I end up turning down a lot of things. You know, I don't, I don't travel a whole lot to where, you know, to do, some people hit the conference circuit and, you know, they'll go to, you know, 15 meetings a year or whatever. And I don't do that. You know, I would much rather spend time with my kids while they still want to spend time with me uh, because they're young enough. And I know that eventually there'll come a time when, you know, they'll, they'll be teenagers and don't want to hang around dad anymore, but that, that's really what it takes for me to get by and deal with those things is um, having a safe place to process it with people that I trust, um, you know, professionally, but also having, you know, time to spend family and that sort of thing, too. Um, both of those things are, are really, really important to me to have. Um, I, I try to exercise as much as I can. Um, I exercise more now than more consistently now than I ever have in my life. And I think that helps overall. Uh, that seems to be a pretty common theme, you know, when I listen to your other podcasts, uh, guests and stuff like that, as a really trying to take care of yourself um, is, is really important. To, and I think we've learned that the hard way over the years as a profession, that you really have to take care of yourself. And I think that helps with being mentally okay and dealing with hard things like complications. Perfect. And speaking of that, what do you do for exercise? Uh, so probably one of the best things that we've gotten over the past several years was um, when we, when Charlie and I first got out of training, that first Christmas, our Christmas present to ourselves was a Peloton. Um, and so we, we do Peloton, uh, both of us do that. So I ride on the bike and I actually, within Peloton, there's other things too. And so I, I also do the strength classes in that. Um, I used to run more. But um, one of the many things that I've given up as I grow older has been running because I ran into IT band issues. And, you know, I like running. I like having that time to myself. But also, it's not worth it to me to have to do 30 minutes of stretches in order to just run for, you know, 30 minutes or whatever it is, um, or even longer. It's just not worth it to me. You know, I could, you know, get on the bike and not have that issues. Um, we have a dog. We have a little bit of a menagerie at home. So we have a dog, we have two cats, three kids, uh, a couple of chickens. Uh, and uh, uh, I walk the dog a lot too. And that's where that's where I get, now that I'm not driving so much, um, that's where I get a lot of my podcast listening done is I'll go walk the dog for, you know, 45 minutes or an hour. Perfect. And then how do you manage, so as you say, your wife is also, I'm sure, has a call and has a lot of commitments in medicine and, you have uh, three daughters, as you mentioned, and your schedule, I'm sure, it's not quite easy. So how do you guys manage all this time, the coordination, getting the kids taken care of, getting yourself taken care of? How do you manage all these things running at the same time? Well, I, um, I think a couple of things to note is that, one, my wife's schedule is, her call schedule is much more than mine. You know, she's having to cover two hospitals. She has a level one trauma, and then she also covers a level three trauma. Um, and so she ends up taking a lot more call than me. Um, and for what I do... You know, I, I view her as much more like having an impact on people than, than what I do, by and large. Um, you know, she describes her specialty as primarily old people falling, uh, car accidents, and then what happens after someone says, hold my beer and watch this. And, um, you know, when uh, I remember, you know, one, one way I can kind of rule out people is I remember there was one case, there was two, I had a case and she had a case on the same day, I think. And my case was, um, you know, recurrent instant restenosis. It was one of those at the stent, the old stent was like shaped like an hourglass because it wasn't fully expanded. And, you know, I, I lasered, I, you know, I lithotripsy, I wrote it out and all that. And at the, at the end of the day, I was really proud of myself. You know, I put in like, you know, an hour and a half, two hours of work on this thing. And uh, it went from like this to this, you know, just <laughs> barely got bigger on there which for me was great. You know, it went from like a millimeter and a half on, a, on fluoroscopy even, not even counting the IVUS, to like three millimeters. Um, and that was great expansion. The same day, um, she had a patient whose arm got caught in a drill press and completely like ripped her, you know, right arm to shreds and, you know, breaking all, breaking everything and all that. And she reconstructed that with like pens and, and all this stuff. And that to me was amazing because we had those same cases, like on the same days, each challenging our own profession. And I remember one of showing it to one of the local reps here. And then he was like, oh, but at the end of the day, don't you think you made more of a difference in that patient's life? And I was like, man, you're so full of it because 
uh, my guy can walk a hundred more feet without angina and her person has a functioning dominant arm. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's really challenging to deal with, um, that sort of thing. And the answer is we do it because we have to, right. It's like deciding to have kids, you know, there's no perfect time. You do it. You just choose to do it and you go all in. Uh, we have a nanny that really helps us. Um, I, again, I turn down a lot of stuff so that I can spend time at home. Um, that really helps, but you just have to kind of do it. Um, you know, I think honestly, I would be, I know you're interviewing me here, but I would like to turn the table a little bit because, you know, you're famously one of the most prolific people in this field. I mean, how do you manage the time? How do you do all that? Um, you know, that I, I find myself on like a constant, I feel like a hamster on a wheel, you know, trying to keep things going and, you know, there's no time to stop. Um, but I'm looking for tips and I think you might be someone to, to give them. Well, I mean, the tips are, it's very simple, right? You have so many hours, so there are two ways you can do. One is be more efficient, so you don't have to make everything perfect, perfect. So if, if it's going to take you an hour to make something at 90% versus four hours to make it 95%, that extra three hours is not worth it for the 5%. So being very efficient is the one thing, but at the end of the day, you're right. If you have enough things, even if you're the most efficient place on the pl yeah. person on the planet, you have to decide what is important and what is not, and you make a decision, whether that's going to a meeting, whether it's writing a paper, whether it's going with your family, you have to make the final decisions in the end. So there's no magic to it. End of the day is, yes, there is room for efficiency, but once you become efficient, and you will, and it looks like you are very efficient. I mean, if you're driving and you're thinking all these cases, and make, you know, that's actually a perfect way to combine things. But even that, right, you can do only so much. So you have to decide what's important. You know, if being with the kids is more important, which it should be for most people, that's the best way to do it. And th that helps you have no regrets too. I mean, yes, you can sacrifice mm -hmm. your sleep, but then if you do that, it's going to, you know, snowball and the next day it will be worse and then your mood is going to be bad and you'll be not productive at all. So th there's no magic to it. It's do less and be more efficient, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, you say there's no magic to it, but it's also really hard to do that, um, especially consistently because, you know, there's, you're right, there's only so much hours a day. And uh, I think that's, that, that way of thinking about it is spot on. And trying to live, you know, with as few regrets as possible, um, you know, no one looks back on their tombstone, on their, like on their, on their epitaph and stuff and says, you know, wish I'd spent more time in the office. And I, I, you know, I try to keep that in mind too. And speaking of that, which books are your favorite or your favorite movie? Oh man. So, um, I will say a few things. One is that, um, there hasn't been a lot of movies that I've watched over the past several years that haven't been, uh, around kids. Um, so, but as far as in general, I think all time favorites, um, I'm going to echo actually, uh, Tony and Kate, what they told you, um, cause the princess bride is something that we watch a lot of. And, um, elf is also an all time classic. I think it may be the greatest movie of all time. It's just so tight. So well done. Um, other ones that are our favorites are nightmare before Christmas. Uh, that's a big one. In fact, when we were moving to Cincinnati and, uh, we were breaking it to the girls, we had this hype building weekend. So we didn't tell them we were moving until we actually came here to visit for the weekend. And we always, the zoo, we had this uh, aquarium. And one of the things that we did was the Cincinnati symphony does this thing where they will have a movie showing and they will play the score live. And it's really a great thing. And uh, they do that with about five or six movies a year. But the weekend we brought the girls, they were doing The Nightmare Before Christmas. And so that was like a huge deal. And it was so fun. Um, and uh, more recently for like adult fair, I guess, uh, or more adult is uh, recently I've watched the, the Knives Out. Uh, Knives Out and then Glass Onion as the second one in the series uh, with Daniel Craig. And those are just really fun. Uh, I like a good, good detective movie. Um, as far as books go, um, you know, I would say there's a few, like as far as all time favorite books, um, probably one that I have read more than any, uh, well, actually just thinking of the princess bride, if you haven't read the book, uh, you should, uh, because it's really, it's, it's a nice book. And the way that it's told is a lot like the film is told with this kind of meta narration thing. Um, but other ones, uh, there was a book when, that I started reading when I was in philosophy because one of the things I, I really liked was philosophy of religion and it was called reenchantment without supernaturalism. It was about process philosophy of religion. That was really good. Uh, it's probably not the typical answer you get for this sort of thing. It's probably, it's <laughs> the most densest book I've ever read in my life, I think. Um, and, uh, it's the whole book that I have. I've read through it several times and it's all marked up and stuff. And it's really fun. Um, I've recently been on a Cormac McCarthy, um, 
trip. So uh, if you're in the mood for something that, I don't know, just might shatter all hope in your life, um, then it's really a good, <laughs> good read. Something like The Road uh, is so you know desolate, but so beautiful in its own way. Um, and it's, it's, it's really good. So those are a couple that I've done, you know, kind of recently. Um, another one that really helped me a lot personally was called the road back to you. And when I was trying to, cause you know, when I was in Evansville and stuff, um, one of the things that I lost sight of for a little bit was the fact that you only have so many hours in a day because within a year out of training, just through one thing after another, I was the, um, head of the cardiovascular service line and head of the cath lab. And to, to have those positions at such a really early stage in my career uh, was, you know, kind of intimidating, obviously, uh, but also learning, I had to learn a lot about myself really fast and how to deal with others and how to manage, you know, or manage a group, manage a service line and finding out more about myself, the road back to you, um, which uses something called the Enneagram is that was a really good thing for me for self-exploration. That's another book that I've read a lot. I'll go back to a uh, time and time again. Um, and that role actually helped me learn how to say no a lot too, you know, because you can't help, you can't please everyone all the time. And learning that lesson early in my career has, I think has really paid off and I anticipate it's going to continue to pay off as I continue to grow and, you know, my family continues to grow. And then I see behind you this happy birthday that has some story with it, I guess. So is that, do you play music in the lab and what's yeah. your favorite music? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So obviously, uh, I, I will, I will tell you a few things. So yeah, this happy birthday up here behind me, um, it's been up there for about four months <laughs> and every, thing on there is a different picture of Taylor Swift. And if you actually look, you know, kind of between the diplomas and it's also scattered around my office are little uh, things about Taylor Swift. And, um, you know, I, I do like Taylor Swift a lot. Um, and uh, we actually have Swifter Noons in the lab, something I started when I was a fellow in Indy. So some afternoons we'll just play Taylor Swift. Um, I grew up, you know, I played guitar a lot when I was a kid and I got out of it for a while, but it was one of the things that I picked up again during the pandemic. And that's been really fun. And actually, um, uh, several months ago, or a few months ago, I started taking piano lessons. I've never played piano before. Um, and it's something that, that I always, you know, thought about and wanted to do, but I didn't know how to read music. So that's been really, really fun and really enjoying. Uh, you know, the, I also take my oldest too. Uh, I've got one daughter that also takes piano lessons and another daughter that takes drums, uh, which is totally their personalities too. Uh, music has always played a big role in my life. And I do play music in the cath lab, like a lot. I've got my own playlist with everything from, you know, Mozart to Outkast, uh, you know, just a wide variety of music uh, with uh, now I think it's up to about 1500 songs on it. You know, it's just always added. And um, that, that really helps in the lab, these longer cases, especially. I, there are some people out there that don't listen to any music during a CTO case or in the cath lab. And I just cannot, you know, fathom what that is like. Um, because sometimes you really need it. Uh, every once in a while when you're struggling and like a slow song comes on, you have to skip it. Um, but uh, it, it really, really helps. It helps the day go by and it helps, you know, I think the lab also, uh, you know, work a lot better and more efficiently. So it's, it's really fun. It's a big part of my life. So do you think that uh, using playing the guitar helped you become a good city operator? Uh, you know, I'm going to go with that because it seems that way, um, because it, may, I don't know, it seems like a better story. Uh, I don't know if it does, but, you know, it does help with dexterity and rhythm. I find that there's, a, there's definitely a rhythm to cases. Um, and because I'm already, you know, because I think in terms of rhythm a lot, whether it's music or, you know, life in general, things kind of come and go. And um, cases are like that, too. And I think the easier you're able to recognize that, then it can actually help you. Um, you know, figure it out. I do think that it probably helps me with my twiddling skills, you know, with the wire and getting the microcatheters down there. And especially, you know, every, it seems like everyone has a slightly different way that they use microcatheters. Um, and that coordination between right and left hand, I think it really, really helps. Um, you know, I've got a great CTO partner here at Christ. His name is James Kong. And he and I, you know, we both use different things. And I've kind of teased him a little bit sometimes because I noticed that sometimes the, the, the faster he spins microcatheter corresponds with the beat per minute for the song that's on. And so, you know, sometimes we might need to pump it up a little bit. 
Well, as you say, I love the, I love, I love your thoughts, and I agree with you. There is the rhythm in the case, and you make the rhythm. And if you make it too slow, it's going to be a painful oh, rhythm. So yeah. <laughs> the city yeah. cases, it will be a little more active and going. And that's, uh, you know, the fellows obviously can play a role in that. You know, if you have to slow down to help them keep up, that can have a yeah. negative impact on the case. And speaking of that, what do you think was the hardest thing for you to learn and to teach people in terms of CTO techniques? Oh, that's a great question. Um, because, you know, we I had interventional fellows at St. Vincent. We, we just started a general cardiology fo- uh, program here at Christ and eventually we'll add interventional to that. Um, I feel like the, the hardest two things, I guess, one mental, one physical. Um, and I think it's both CTOs are both mental and physical because I do think, you know, there's that thinking process that goes on. That's really important, but it's also about learning the, the feel and how to utilize wires and microcatheters. I sort of think of the Yogi Berra quote about baseball that, you know, it's 80% uh, mental and 40% physical. <laughs> uh, I think CTOs are probably like that too. And I think the hardest mental thing for it to break through was uh, and, you know, this is a, a thing that I'm constantly learning is when is it almost and, you know, when you, whenever you have an almost situation, like we kind of mentioned before, you know, you've almost got it. You're almost there. And you fall into that trap of doing the same things over and over. When have you truly almost got it? And you just need to make some small little subtle change to actually get it versus when to give up. And most of the time, it seems to be to give up whatever you're doing and move on to something else. And trying to get out of that almost trap, I think, is mentally the most challenging thing. Um, and teaching fellows, um, I, that's what I uh, really try to hammer on. And, you know, even things like, you know, they've almost got it or whatever, and they want to take a puff or something like that. You know, what? what would giving this little amount of contrast do to change what you're doing right now? You know, and the answer is it's probably not going to change anything. Um, But getting them out of that mental habit. And I think physically one of the most challenging things um, is to um, learn about why your feel and the right and how bends can affect on that. Um, And, you know, when it, when it goes and when it doesn't go and kind of knowing, you know, knowing what it should feel like and learning how to quickly, you know, flip it in where you want it to go. Uh, I think that may be the cha- most challenging physical thing. And it's a very, it's often a very, very light touch. You know, my touch has gotten so much lighter over the years uh, by just doing these. You know, it's just, it's so subtle and it's so hard to teach and it's so hard to learn, I think. Just do cases, just do a whole lot of cases. So nothing like the practice, right? Practice, practice, practice. Yeah. So, so Jared, you've done so many things, obviously, at this such an early stage and do phenomenal work. What are the things that you are most proud of so far? Uh, you know, I think professionally and personally, um, are two different things, you know, personally, you know, I think a lot of us with kids will say that our kids are our most proudest thing. I mean, it's so fun, um, to have kids. Um, and it's just watching them grow up has been so exciting. And especially when you see them do certain things or, you know, say certain phrases or whatever, and you're like, where did they get that? And then you realize, oh yeah, that, that came from me. That was totally me. I do that all the time. Um, and whether it's like them trying to bargain things um, or, or whatever, they'll keep coming out with like, how about this? How about this? How about this? And that's, you know, I hear a lot of me in that, uh, giving them options and stuff. Um, so that's just been, it's been really a treat. I think most of the days, uh, they're the most wonderful things in the world. Um, and it's, it's really, really fun. The days can be long, but the years are short. That's for sure. Um, you know, professionally, one of the things I'm most proud of, I guess, is that, um, you know, I think uh, a couple things spring to mind. One is the fact that I feel like every place that I've been so far, you know, in Evansville and Indianapolis and now at Christ, I'm trying to leave things a little bit better than when I arrived. You know, sometimes, you know, they start off pretty good, but trying to have a, a net commitment. Um, with St. Vincent and Evansville, uh, where I started there, you know, I the, the way that that, when I left the St. Vincent system altogether, that was in such a much better place than when I started by, by any metric um, as far as patient outcomes and treating patients and making the system more efficient and building things. That's been really a joy. I've been able to help out in Indianapolis too. And then, you know, also I uh, keep in close contact with those folks and seeing how much that program has continued to grow, um, you know, with some, some of the stepping stones that I helped lay to grow up beyond where it was. 
And then here at the Christ, it's been it's been really really fun um, to you know start a new place, have some skills already established, but being able to grow more and to grow the CTO program. You know, we have a new CTO coordinator started about the same time I did, and being able to grow that from scratch. Um, and now with hot CTO summer just around the corner, we're we're gearing up. Uh, it's been it's been really fun and really rewarding to see this in action um, at these different places and being able to help a lot of people um, and help people feel better and be able to do what they want to do in life. It's, that's just been really rewarding. It doesn't get old. And uh, what excites you the most right now? You know, the thing that excites me the most right now, um, I think in the professional field, uh, because personally, you know, obviously it's, it's been pretty fun with family. And also, um, Charlotte and I have our 15th wedding anniversary coming up uh, in uh, a few weeks. Thanks. Uh, we kind of had like uh, a bit of a whirlwind. Uh, we started dating in uh, like mid-September, engaged the beginning of January and married in May. Like that was kind of, that, that was our thing. And that's almost 15 years ago. And we're actually going with a group of friends to Indonesia. Um, we're spending two and a half weeks out there. And that's gonna be really fun. I'm not looking forward to the journey because uh, it's about 30 hours of travel, um, but we're really looking forward to that. So that's kind of exciting. And um, and then I think the thing that excites me professionally is one of the, my projects that I'm trying to get off the ground here is um, to help sort of be a, a build a network, um, you know, be that kind of generator to, to help uh, connect people. Um, I, I I have this whole metaphor about candles and, you know, fire and stuff like that, um, that I use to describe it. But, um, the, the essence of it is being able to help other people on the journey and make that connection. Because I felt like, you know, the, the OGs, you know, that started this and then, you know, the, the other people that came in shortly thereafter, uh, like you did, you know, you kind of had this network and this really great collaboration between each other and bouncing cases off each other and all this stuff. And, you know, being able to help in times of struggle and being able to celebrate together, you know, in times of happiness and stuff like that, as the, the field just started to blow up. And I feel like my generation kind of missed out on that. And it can be really hard to make those connections. And so one of the things I'm really excited about is um, I'm starting a program to help build those things and to make it kind of more reliable. Um, because I, I missed out on that a lot. You know, part of it was just all the work I was doing with St. Vincent and all that. I just didn't have time to get out there. But I found that that's a really common thing. Like a lot of folks my age are having the same concerns and the same struggles. And it's important to know that you're not alone. And so starting that program um, to build it up, uh, is, that's one of the things I'm most excited about. And there's a lot more to come uh, in the next several months. We're going to be really building it out there. Perfect. Well, again, that's, that's phenomenal. And as you said, I mean, having uh, some sort of support and be able to call someone and bounce a question or a complication happens or... Uh, any technical difficulty that's, that's huge and helps feel better, get their outcomes, everyone wins, I guess, uh, in the end. Yeah. So, Jared, this was amazing. I mean, I'm just uh, impressed that the width and depth of everything you've done so far, it's really impressive. If you had to give the last kind of uh, uh, advice for people who are starting this or uh, are thinking of starting, what they should do about learning this and moving on and becoming uh, great operators, what would you offer them? Uh, a few things come to mind. One is that um, you're not alone. And I want you, and it's important to realize that. And both personally, you know, realize that you're not alone and you can find people, uh, come to conferences, come to courses, that sort of things. You know, seek out other like minded people to, to be there to help you and to bounce cases off of and, you know, with your struggles. Uh, that's, I think, a really important thing is to realize you're not alone. There's a lot of kind of like subtle tips and tricks and stuff like that, that that I developed on my own that I really wish somebody had told me before because it turns out a lot of people were already doing them and it really would have helped me to know that earlier. Um, and, but you're not alone. Uh, I think that's that's one thing. There's a ton of resources out there to learn. Uh, obviously, you know, your your book is tremendous. It's, it's literally the only textbook that I've ever read cover to cover. Um, so, you know, the both, I haven't finished the third one yet. It just came out, but the first two I did. Uh, as well as, you know, YouTube videos and stuff like that. There's always so many places to learn. Um, and then the last thing is just do cases. You know, they're out there. Uh, we know they're out there. Um, you know, studies have consistently shown for CTOs, for instance, that about one out of five angiograms have at least one CTO. Doesn't mean they all have to be opened. Um, but they're out there and just do them. And not all cases are the same, you know. 
And it's okay to start with something that looks a little more straightforward. I'm not going to say that there's an easy CTO because easy is a post-operative diagnosis only. Uh, but, you know, there's some that look more straightforward and, you know, it's okay to tackle those. And if there's something that looks more challenging, you know what, it's okay if you refer that on to somebody else and then go travel with them. You know, I just had somebody that came and visited last week, you know, that referred a patient to me and he wanted to come see how I tackled that. And those sorts of things are really, really helpful. And if you're not sure where to start, you know, just drop probably either one of us, you know, I'm pretty open. I know you are too. Just drop us a line and we can help, you know, get you started. There is uh, CTO has grown enough that you know, regardless of where you are in the country, there's somebody, you know, at least within a few hours that, that probably does an okay amount and you can learn from. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. Thanks, Joe. So we'll make sure we put your cell number and uh, and uh, email on the podcast so everyone can call you at 24-7, 365. <laughs> no, yeah, kidding. so this is, it's important to know how to silence your notifications, uh, <laughs> especially at night. Uh, but yeah, no. And I will say, you know, if you want to, I'll drop my email. I don't answer my phone. I'm not consistent about that. But yeah, jared.frizzell, J-A-R-R-O-D dot F-R-I-Z-Z-E-L-L at the Christ Hospital com. It's pretty easy. Um, you know, just anybody drop me a line. If you have any questions or anything like that, um, I'm happy to connect you with people. I don't know everybody, but I know who to ask. And, um, that, that's really important. Well, again, thanks so much. Congrats on amazing work so far and looking forward to many more great things coming from your site. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate, um, you having this opportunity to have me on. And, uh, this, this is one of my, my best podcasts. Uh, that I listen to. So it's really, really fun to have all these insights. Wonderful. Thanks again, Jared. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Sensei Podcast. 